Hi everyone, welcome to my DTF for Beginners course. Um, in this course, I'll be going over everything you need to know about DTF uh, from start to finish, as far as like getting the printer set up, um, as far as the process of DTF, uh, what's needed for it, um, as well as other things like maintenance, um, how to maintain your printer for long periods of time um, to keep it going, um, as, and then it, also the end process. Uh, I know a lot of you guys struggle with getting good quality prints um, out of out of your uh, out of your printers, and, or even just the, getting the vibrant colors that you see. Um, that'll be another thing that we'll go through in detail, so that way you guys can have that um, and get your get your brands going and your your shops going. Part one: What is DTF? Uh, DTF is a way to transfer graphics onto fabric and other materials, you know, such as hoodies, hats, that type of thing, um, using heat and pressure. The designs are printed directly onto a, onto a special film made for DTF using various color inks. Um, once that film is then printed out, you can, uh, it goes through a powder and curing process. And then afterwards, you're able to attach that transfer to pretty much anything you can think of. Um, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, bags, um, wood, any, most materials DTF will stick to. There's like only a few things that it won't stick to. Um, but if you can apply enough heat and pressure, it will stick to most things. All right. What makes DTF different from other printing processes such as like sublimation, um, or direct to garment, which only work on certain materials or certain colors, uh, such as like cotton. Uh, DTF doesn't have that limitation. Uh, you're able to print on dark color garments. You're able to do pretty much any color garment. Uh, well, any color garment, it doesn't matter. Um, and, then, and, and then it's not limited to the types of materials. So you can do cottons, you can do the poly blends, you can do, uh, I've done tri, I usually, this is a tri blend uh, from uh, Bella Canvas tri blend. So, and you, as you can see, the colors are very vibrant. Um, that's that's kind of what the difference is for DTF. Uh, there's uh, not very many limitations with it. All right, so let's go through what's needed for DTF. The most important thing, um, or two most important things, and kind of like the first two, is you're gonna wanna get a printer. Um, you're gonna need a printer. So choosing the printer, the way the best way to do it is first, first you're gonna want to find your printer, uh, whatever printer you have access to already, or whatever printer you're looking at. Um, you want to first then look for that. Um, once you've decided on that, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna look for a RIP program. Uh, which is just a raster imaging process program. Uh, what the RIP program does, it allows you to print the DTF. Um, without the RIP program, you're not able to do the printing uh, where you're able to print this white background behind the image so you can keep your colors vibrant um, and also correct the colors because you're gonna be using um, a different set of colors than what the printer knows is in the printer. So the RIP process will allow you to um, bypass that and uh, make those adjustments um, on the printer. So this is going to be your most important thing you're going to need to get is some type of RIP program. Um, so once you've decided on your printer, then you're going to research, okay, I need to find a RIP program that supports that printer. If, if the RIP program, if you can't find a RIP program to support that printer, then you're not able to use that printer. Most Epson's with a six color uh, tank can be converted over um, and they also have RIP programs available for them. Um, most of the equal tanks besides, um, most of the equal tanks can't be used. The only two that can be used are the 8500 and the 8550. So those are going to be your only two uh, equal tanks, but the rest of the Epsons, uh, majority, especially like the older printers with six colors and six color channels, most of those could be used for DTF. But first, look for your printer, and then next, once you find your printer, then you're gonna look for your RIP program. Once you find your RIP program, 
um, you could just Google search um, RIP program for such and such printer. So you go XP15000 uh, RIP program and uh, DTF RIP program and it should pop up. Um, I'll also have links in the in the um, description so you guys can uh, um, find the software a lot easier. Um, majority of RIP programs are all on the same site, so uh, it'll be that it'll be that much easier. So once you've done that, find your RIP program that you've used. So I use Acarip. Um, this is just one of the RIP programs. Um, it supports most printers, uh, especially most Epson printers. Uh, majority of them are are, are uh, supported. Um, there is no trial for this for this program, um, but it is one of the easiest programs to use since it's very uh, basic and like kind of simple, um, and everything's kind of straight to uh, straight to the point. Um, they labeled everything, so it's pretty easy to use. Um, but yeah, you, there's other RIP programs out there, so just find the RIP program that your the printer that you have access to or printer that you're gonna get. Find one that supports that printer, and then if you if you find that, then you can use that printer. So once you've done that, then you'll have your RIP program, you have your printer. Once you got the two, the RIP program and your printer, you, okay, you've got that stuff. Next, start. you want to start gathering the materials. Um, DTF ink, you're going to need at least five colors, which is going to be cyan, magenta, yellow and then black and then white um, the six the six channel is just whatever extra channels you have generally are just filled with white the rest of the colors are just single channels um, so if you have six six uh, ink channels two of them are white if you have you know eight channels four of them are going to be white um, or two two are going to be white and two may be uh, cleaning cleaning cards but that's something else we'll get into later in the future um, but for the most part or for all for everything this is this is the set you will need um, which is just cyan magenta yellow black white um, you'll just need these two these these five colors so once you have that um, you can get that I'll have links for it as for you guys um, in the description um, where you can find the DTF ink um, most important is your white. You want to get a good quality white. Um, so that way you can keep going. White tin, white is going to be the usual color that clogs the most um, because it does tend to clump up uh, when, it's, when it's been sitting for long periods of time. But um, so that's why you do want to get a good quality. Um, these are DTG, uh, DTG Pro inks. Um, I really haven't had any issues with them. Um, I've been using them for probably over a year and it's been pretty good. But uh, the uh, Quantum ones I've just started using. This is my first time having them. Um, I don't know if I can tell you if I can see a difference. <laughs> but the price I think is it is pretty similar. So uh, I went with these this time. But, um, yeah, so that's going to be the next thing you want to get, some DTF ink. Next thing you want to get is uh, some DTF powder. Um, it looks like sugar. Um, this one comes in like a milk carton. So uh, uh, what, is, what, the, what is the powder? Um, the powder is the adhesive um, that allows the graphic to stick to, or a graphic or transfer, whatever. Um, to stick to uh, the material. So you wanna get a good quality uh, powder. Um, I like the more um, thicker thicker powders. I found those last, last longer um, than some of the more refined powders. Um, my prints don't last as long and they also um, tend to crack more um, when I'm curing them. So, uh, you, def you might need to try out a few powders, see which one works best for you. Um, but that'll be the next thing you're going to get. The other thing you're going to get is some DTF film. I have two here. One is a uh, glossy side right there. And then this one is a double-sided matte. Um, double-sided matte doesn't mean you can print on both sides. There's only one printable side. Um, 
I haven't found a double, double, uh, a film that you can print on both sides yet, or I haven't used one yet. But majority of the sides, even if they say double, is just means both sides have a uh, matte coating on them, so they look the same. But only one side is printable. Um, to tell which side is printable, the easiest way to do is to scratch it. When if you get some like powder residue on your finger, that's the printable side. So you can do that on both sides, on uh, both both films, and you'll see some scratch marks on it that will leave like a little powder residue um, under your fingernail, and you can tell that's your print side. So um, the next thing with the film, uh, there's hot. And cold peel hot meaning you can peel it right after you uh, right after you press it you oh um, you can peel it while the design is still hot so when you press it, it the design will be hot for a few seconds um, it'll be hot for a little bit um, and you're able to peel that uh, while it's still still warm um, the cold peel uh, cold peel film uh, just means it needs to cool down before you can peel it uh, there is a difference in the two. Um, I I like I like more the uh, the cold peel. It's easier to peel. I had issues with hot peel. Um, trying to peel it hot was definitely a lot harder to do, especially when I was first starting out. Um, I ran into the issue where just I I'm not sure if I wasn't putting enough pressure but it would stick to the shirt and then sometimes the graphic would get stuck on the shirt. So I found the uh, the cold peel um, or just peeling it cold. So even if you have hot peel, just peel it while, it, while it's, uh, while after it's cooled down, uh, was way easier. Um, and I had a lot less issues uh, with peeling. So just keep that in mind. That's another thing um, and also the next thing uh, with the with the film is different films will give you different outcome. Um, it does affect your end your end quality uh, of what you produce. Some film feels more like paper. Some film um, feels more like a direct to garment or screen print, depending on how you how the person did it. Um, for instance, this. This one was done with the glossy, glossy film, and it it's soft, but it still feels more paperish. Um, and then some, like when I do half tones and stuff, it feels like there's nothing on the shirt. So it does make a difference um, in the quality of your film. In the same thing, you may want to test out a few different films and see which one works best for you. you need something to cure. Uh, whether it be, uh, I started with my heat press, uh, it takes a couple minutes, but if you're doing a ton of graphics, it's going to take a while, uh, or a lot of your time, it does become very laborious and, um, yeah, just laborious, uh, to do each, each, uh, print by hand if you're using your heat press. So I recommend getting, um, I use, now I'm using a, a heat mat which I can just put the uh, put the film on and then it goes through the process. I don't have to do any, I don't have to uh, do as much. I could just let it sit there, cure, and then uh, when it's done, I'll just lift it up. Um, the other option and probably the best option, especially depending on how much you're printing and if you're printing in large quantities, is to get a um, conveyor oven and uh, auto, auto shaker, uh, auto powder shaker. Uh, which does that whole powder and curing process for you. It's automatic. The whole process then becomes automatic um, from print to print to finish. Um, I recommend doing that if you're going to be printing large quantities. Um, if you're just printing every day, um, printing like, you know, probably under, I would say, probably, probably under 100 prints a day, um, or you're doing small orders, then you probably don't need an auto shaker and a, um, auto shaker and oven. The heat map or some type of uh, some people are using uh, convection ovens. Um, just keep in mind that there is a lot of smoke 
So you do want to have some type of ventilation or fans going um, to prevent the smoke detectors and stuff from going off. Next thing you're going to need is a heat press. Um, I recommend getting at least probably a 16 by probably 20. Um, that'll allow you to pretty much heat press most most garments um, up to probably like 3x. You, I've done 4x on there. Um, it just depends on how big the graphic that you're trying to print. But if you're just doing majority of like the converted printers, um, that size will fit pretty much uh, most of the graphics that you'll print. If you're doing uh, something a little bit bigger than you may want to get a bigger heat press, but 16 by 20 um, is probably the recommended one. Um, the ones on Amazon, I wasn't a fan of. I started with the little Amazon one uh, with the turn, uh, with like the turnout. Um, I didn't have great success on it. It may be because I was doing it wrong um, or, you know, just the issues. But uh, yeah, I was like, it took me like 40 minutes to do one shirt. So it was, and it usually takes like 10 seconds. Like, uh, <laughs> it usually takes like 10 seconds now, but um, yeah, I was originally, it would take forever. So I don't recommend those. I recommend getting like a actual heat press from uh, a store that sells heat presses. Next thing you're gonna get is uh, extra maintenance boxes. Uh, these, are, these are for, um, for ink waste and once this chip on the printer or once this chip on the box uh, reaches zero um, it won't let you print anymore so you definitely want to have some on hand um, so that way you can continue printing because once it reaches zero unless you have either a uh, chip reset uh, which will go through next uh, or extra maintenance boxes you can't print at all it, it won't let you print so there's no way to bypass that um, so you want to make sure you have some extra at hand. Next, chip resetter. Um, it's probably recommended and it will save you money in the long run. Um, the chip resetter, what it does is it resets the maintenance box. So this chip that I was referring to on the maintenance box, um, you could take the chip resetter and uh, just push it on there and then it will uh, just hold it there for a couple seconds and it will reset it back to 100. Um, so it's easy to have, and that way you can still use the same maintenance box, especially if you're, um, most people um, usually use some type of external waste tank, uh, so the, the uh, ink doesn't flow into this box, but this box always has to be in the printer. So, so no matter what, you have to reset it at, at some point. So it's great to have these on hand. Um, that way you can always reset the box as many times as you want. Um, and then also, they're, they're different, um, make, uh, different chip resetters for different things, um, whether it be printer specific um, or some are for your maintenance boxes. And if you're using, um, you're using uh, cartridges, some reset the carts. So just keep that in mind. You want to make sure you get the correct one. What you're going to want to have is some type of a cleaning solution handy. Um, that way you can clear clogs and just do some daily maintenance with it. Um, uh, I have a couple more that I usually use. So this is one that I made myself, which is just uh, uh, distilled water in uh, Windex, which it works pretty well. Um, but I found that actual cleaning solution does work a lot better. <laughs> uh, especially if you're going to be trying to run the printer long term. Uh, you definitely want to have something a little bit more official. Uh, I also use another uh, solution, which is a, just a wet cap solution uh, to help keep the, uh, the print head from drying out uh, when I'm not using it. Um, and that just helps further also preventing any clogs or any issues uh, long term. 